At the southern end of Cayuga Lake in upstate New York sits the small village of Hammondsport. Founded in 1827 and incorporated in 1856, the village boasts a population of only several hundred people. However, the town also can boast that on May 21, 1878, it was the birthplace of the aviation pioneer Glenn Curtis. Left fatherless at age four, Curtis, along with his younger sister Rutha, was raised by his widowed mother, Lua Curtis. At age six, Rutha came down with meningitis, causing her to become deaf. So Lua moved the family to Rochester, New York, so Rutha could attend a school for hearing-impaired children. To provide for her family, Lua attended the State Teachers College in Geneseo and ran a storefront school in Rochester. While growing up, Glenn Curtis worked for the Eastman Dry Plate and Film Company, and later as a messenger for Western Union. In March of 1898, he married Lena Pearl Neff and settled in Hammondsport. Like those other aviation pioneers, the Wright brothers, Curtis designed, built, and repaired bicycles. Unlike the Wrights, however, Curtis was more willing to risk the dangers associated with high-speed racing. He added motors to his bikes, converting them to motorcycles, and then started racing them. Knowing of the Wright brothers' success with airplanes, Curtis wrote to them in May 1906 to see if he could interest them in one of his engines. In August, he met them in person, but the fiercely independent Wrights bought nothing. The year 1907 kept Curtis very busy. In January, at Ormond Beach, Florida, he rode the world's first V8 motorcycle to a speed of 136 miles per hour, earning for himself the title of fastest man on earth. In June, he flew over Hammondsport in a Thomas Baldwin dirigible powered by a Curtis engine. He was so taken by human flight that, after alighting from the craft, he soon started planning how to make the dirigible fly faster. In October, he joined the Aerial Experiment Association, or AEA, an aviation group founded by inventor Alexander Graham Bell and financed by Bell's wife, Mabel. 1908 also was a busy year for Curtis, as he worked closely with Bell's organization. Besides Bell and Curtis, the group's leaders included the Canadian F.W. Casey Baldwin, the Canadian John McCurdy, and U.S. Army Lieutenant Thomas Selfridge. In March, Baldwin took off from a frozen Keuka Lake in an airplane called the Red Wing. After flying erratically for 20 seconds, the plane hit the lake on one wing and crashed. Two months later, Curtis made a controlled flight of over 1,000 feet in an aircraft called the White Wing, making it the first airplane in history to use ailerons for control purposes. On Independence Day, Curtis flew an airplane called the June Bug across Pleasant Valley in Hammondsport for a distance of 5,090 feet. For this achievement, he received the Scientific American Trophy for the first time. With the flights of the White Wing and June Bug, the AEA became the first group in North America besides the Wright brothers to design, build, and fly airplanes. By November, Curtis and McCurdy had added floats to the June Bug aircraft and renamed it the Loon. The AEA tried often to lift the plane off the waters of Keuka Lake, but had no success. McCurdy eventually damaged a float on the plane, and the aircraft sank at the dock. Despite failing to fly a hydroplane, the group had success with a new land-based airplane, the Silver Dart. This plane had larger control surfaces, increasing its maneuverability over previous machines. The AEA took the Silver Dart to Bell's Canadian home in Baddock, Nova Scotia. In February 1909, McCurdy flew the plane into the air, making the first successful airplane flight in Canada. Nevertheless, in March, the AEA disbanded and bequeathed its aircraft designs and patents to Curtis. The flyer from Hammondsport now was back on his own. He built his next airplane, the Golden Flyer, for the Aeronautic Society of New York. 
In July, he flew it for 25 miles. This flight earned him the Scientific American Trophy for a second time. In August, the city of Reims, France, held the world's first international aviation meet. At this event, Curtis flew his Reims racer to a record speed of almost 47 miles per hour. In late September, having returned from Europe, he traveled to New York City to participate in the Hudson Fulton Celebration of 1909. On September 30th, he took off in a small airplane with a four-cylinder engine. Bucking a strong wind, his underpowered plane made a short and unimpressive flight. In late May 1910, Curtis had much more success in impressing New Yorkers. He took off from Albany in a new plane, the Hudson Flyer, and headed south for New York City. This plane, with a 50-horsepower, eight-cylinder engine, was up to its task. Curtis made a planned landing near Poughkeepsie, another stop at the north end of Manhattan, and then landed at Governor's Island. The flight of 150 miles took two hours, 51 minutes, and averaged over 50 miles per hour. It was the longest airplane flight to date, and won for Curtis both a $10,000 prize and permanent possession of the Scientific American Trophy. Despite the crude design of early airplanes, both the Wright brothers and Curtis machines seem to reflect their inventors' personalities. From the beginning, the methodical Wright brothers' wings were ramrod straight and precisely aligned. Their motors and related mechanical equipment looked neat and efficient. In contrast, Curtis's early machines displayed sweeping, curved wings, while motors and related equipment appeared unusually complex. In the 1910s, Curtis moved to the forefront of American aviation in both the quantity and quality of aircraft. He also began to develop planes for naval use. In December of 1910, he arrived at North Island in San Diego Bay to start a U.S. Navy aviation school, where he made his first successful takeoff from water. In February of 1911, Curtis's associate, Eugene Ely, made the first successful hydroplane flight to a ship. In response to these achievements, in May, the U.S. Navy ordered two A-1 hydroplanes from Curtis. His work with the Navy earned him the title of Father of American Naval Aviation. In 1913, Curtis visited the airplane factory of Thomas Sopwith in England where he learned much about tractor-configured airplanes. Curtis's first major tractor planes were the JN-1 and JN-2. He followed these two planes with the JN-3. In 1916, he modified the JN-3 to improve its performance, naming the new model the JN-4. Over the next few years, he came out with over 15 versions of this plane. In 1919, a Curtis flying boat manned by U.S. Navy aviators became the first airplane to fly across the Atlantic. In early May, three flying boats took off from Naval Air Station Rockaway, New York. The planes flew on to Nova Scotia and then to Newfoundland. In mid-May, they left Trapassi Bay and headed for the Azores off the coast of Portugal. Two planes broke down in the ocean. On May 17th, one flying boat, the NC-4, reached Horta in the Azores. Ten days later, it reached Lisbon, Portugal, and then reached Plymouth, England on May 31st. The naval aviators quickly became famous and returned home to the United States as national heroes. Despite the achievement of his flying boats, Curtis left the aviation business in 1920 and moved to Florida. In 1923, he started developing the city of Miami Springs, known then as Country Club Estates. Two years later, he started building a home there. In 1926, he expanded his land developments by establishing the city of Opelika. In 1930, just 52 years old, Curtis was poised to continue his life of innovation and invention. Unfortunately, in early July of that year, on his way to Rochester, he suffered an attack of appendicitis. He was rushed to Buffalo General Hospital, where he underwent surgery. 
In mid-July, Curtis's doctor told newspapers that the famed aviator-turned-businessman was recovering nicely. Nevertheless, on the morning of July 23, 1930, a nurse found him dead on the floor of his hospital room. Despite having lived in Florida for ten years, Glenn Curtis was still a son of Hammondsport, New York. His funeral service was held at St. James Episcopal Church in the village of his birth. He is buried in the Curtis family plot in nearby Pleasant Valley Cemetery, close by the meadow from which he took off in his white-wing aircraft of 1908 and began making aviation history.